everybody, Edo here, and I am super excited today because I have Jopji and Mike here with me, and these two guys, with a number of other people, run KubaCon and GobbleCon, which are two conventions in the California North Bay area, and in particular, KubaCon is this huge regional convention that we look forward to every year, and as part of this channel, we've been trying to look at different aspects of the industry and running and having a convention is a huge part of this industry and it's a growing part of the industry. So um, just to kick things off, why don't you guys just give a little rundown on how you sort of got into doing conventions. I mean, that wasn't what you were always doing. So what, where did it all start? Feels like it's always. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a while. I mean, KubaCon's been around in 16 years, right? This will be uh, 18, 18 years. 18, I apologize. Yeah, so 16 like here at the Hyatt. Yeah. Almost two decades, right? Yeah. So uh, we're talking about a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, when yeah, galaxy far, far away. Galaxy. But so what, um, how, how did you start? Well, uh, my first actual event that I produced, I'll just say, I'll just say this, was I was 10 years old. <laughs> That's, I, I really mean that, that was like you know twenty years ago, ten more. Than you were, I mean, who even knew that? You know that the, my brother and sister and I we had a tennis court at this place, and we all said let's let's make a show, and we sold tickets for fifty cents, and people came. I forgot we did that. I started crying. But so I, yeah, I was you know it was just something I did, and but but Kubicon is a whole a slightly different story. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I love to do is I do what I'm passionate about, like and I love gaming. There's a lot of things I love. Gaming's one of them. And uh, I had been playing Dungeons and Dragons, you know, you know, a lot of the games that people play, and then Magic came out, Magic the Gathering. And this was a kind of a huge new wave, had a lot of interest, a lot of passion from the, from the players. And my buddy and I, Jeff Brain at the time, uh, just said, let's, let's put on a one-day convention, just one day, and run some Magic tournaments, watch some special events. We called it Manifest, it was Manifest 94. And, uh, and that was 1994. Like a couple, couple hundred people, right? I mean, it was a couple hundred people, and it was you know we ran some amazing, really fun stuff that happened that day. People who were there can still look back on that day and say, "I remember Manifest '94." Uh, that turned in '95, '96, and forward on from there. Uh, but as it turns out, Mike was doing similar kind of things around that time. Yeah, um, 1992 was a big year for a lot of people. Uh, Magic uh, came out that year, <laughs> just dropped. Um, and I did the same thing. Uh, I was the president of the San Jose State's uh, Fantasy Strategy Club, and we decided uh, we wanted to do a magic tournament because everybody was coming every week to the club meetings playing magic. Um, and so, yeah, I was like, hey, let's just do something. But uh, everyone's great, sort of slipping. Yeah, it? well, you know, <laughs> I went to school for other things, <laughs> gaming being one of them. But no, so we, we did this, uh, this convention, we called it Spartacon, and uh, I actually contacted Watsi, and David Chase came down to actually run the tournament, and we had a few hundred people. And it was uh, also kind of cool because uh, Gene Seaborg, the owner of Gator Games, actually was our one and only vendor to supply all the cards for everybody for the, for the sealed deck tournament, and that was before she even had a game store. She was running things out of the back of her van when she went to different shows around, I don't know if she left California, but she did lots of shows. Um, so I've known Jean for a long time. She helped us become very successful for the two years that we ran that. Yep. Well, and so, okay, so you're doing your little thing and you're doing your little thing. How does... So, uh, good, good question. We were, uh, we were manifest and as time changed, it was successful, but uh, we, people were less passionate about collectible card games as time went on. They still played them, but it wasn't like, uh, we found that we couldn't run an entire convention based on that. So we took Manifest and we started to change it into a, a full broad convention, you know, to cover all the different kinds of gamings. But um, the challenge with that was branding, and uh, everybody knew Manifest as a collectible card game. So that it, we were forced to be in a position where we were gonna rebrand ourselves and uh, you know, finding names, and we thought, well, we're going to call it Kublicon. And at the same time, we were challenged by the date that we were trying to do the convention. Uh, we'd always been in July, and, and part of that was so we wouldn't step on other conventions' toes. And as a matter of fact, Mike was running a convention uh, on Memorial Day weekend, Game and it was a great Game weekend to run, but we didn't want to bother them. Well, tell us about GameCon. Yeah, so. <clears throat> Fast forward a number of years, and I started attending GameCon, and the owners of GameCon had to 
moved to Texas and the senior volunteers, myself being one of them, they just gave us the keys and said, hey, keep it going because, it. because the people like it. It was over at the Oakland Airport Hilton. Um, the same Hilton, by the way, that Tom Hanks used to work at when he was a kid. There's a big, a big plaque. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, I was running that convention and um, you know, we were about the same size. I think you know, Manifest was around four to 500, we were around the four to 500. Yeah. But what set us apart was the focuses. You know, Manifest, clearly CCGs, you know, even though they were waning, they still were the CCG con. But they also had board gaming because they had a lot of people on staff that were passionate about board gaming. Where, where GameCon had a lot of the historical miniature guys and the sure. fantasy miniature guys and the role-playing guys, and that's kind of what our shtick was. So there were very complimentary conventions, but we hadn't known that yet until a mutual friend of ours kind of like said, hey, why don't you guys talk? And it was at the same time that Jabshi and his people were talking about rebranding anyway, and the key, the crux to that was a good weekend. And I felt that after doing GameCon for three years, that we were going to lose a lot of our, our volunteer staff just in, in fighting and stuff that just wasn't you know, conducive to sure. a good game convention. So we got to talking. We had a little summit. And so first year of KubaCon was 2001. Mm -hmm. and, 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 then, and so just from a scale perspective, uh, what was about the size of your first year? Was it 500? I think we actually 10, hit eight, about 800. Yeah, at the very first year, yeah. because uh, there was something about the com yeah, emergence of those it. two cons that really was successful. Yeah. And, and then continuing along, and, and last year was your biggest year. Uh, 3,300, almost 3,500. 3,300, 3,300. You know exactly how much. the registration, guys. <laughs> I, got, I got the numbers in my head. And, and, and so, and, and, and continuing to grow, grow the, the convention and being really a regional uh, event. So, so, moving off of history for a second, I mean, so just, I think people go to conventions and they enjoy them and they know that people do stuff, but they don't really quite understand the amazing amount of effort that goes into having a con and all of the different parts. So one, you know, what do each of you do specifically uh, for the event? Google, just focus on KubaCon. And then outside of what you guys are doing, what are the little other little bits or the categories that, of other work that's going on by people who are working? I, I like that uh, question also because, it, 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 like you said, a lot of people don't understand really what it takes to put on a convention, and especially a successful convention. Um, I, and I mean that, you know, there, there's, been, there's a lot of, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Growing. I admire anybody who has passion and wants to run a convention. There is an old axiom that says, friends don't let friends run conventions, and it's wise wisdom for the most part. Uh, but what, what I do specifically is, uh, I, I'm really the, I feel like my job is to make sure that everybody else gets what they need to do their jobs. And, um, you know, that includes Mike, who runs our sort of legit, our, our operations stuff, which is registration and a lot, just a lot of the, you know, people moving in and out and getting registered in vans. And then we have a separate guy, Dave, uh, David Gabriel, who's our, another producer, and he, he's just in charge of events. So, you know, everything between, you know, the signs printed behind us because somebody wants a sign and it's going to make their department look better for some reason, uh, you know, my job is to just make sure everything is getting in place so that they can do what they got to do. And rolling in as executive producer over the whole thing. Yeah, over the whole thing, exactly. The buck stops there. <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna get back to Mike, but there is something to be said about that uh, where the buck stops here. And, and one thing that I found for myself over the many years of doing a lot of different businesses is that I, I'm not a good team player uh, and, and I mean that, you know, you have to know your, your sure, limitations. Sure. And there are some, a lot of the local conventions, smaller conventions, and this might get into your que a question later about, it. you know, what do you, what do you as an, an audience, if you're thinking of doing a convention, how do you want to organize it? But what I found for myself is I, I have to be the boss, and, and I have to be in charge, and I have to make decisions. I, and I, and I, I'm also the one who takes all the risk. Uh, I don't work well as a, as a committee. Sure. Um, I like to get input and feedback from people when it's appropriate, and so I can I can make the best decision. But ultimately, dis decisions come to me. And there are a lot of conventions locally that struggle in part because of their organization, because they are run by committees, and it, it's it's a really slow machine when you have a committee. And it is a 
it's slow, but it's also challenging because presumably a lot of people are volunteers and, and, and passionate about what they're doing. So there's that combination of when the buck stops and someone it starts feeling very much of a job. Whereas when that committee system feels like everyone's in it together, so there's a little bit of that challenge to get the vibe and the results that you're looking for, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, <clears throat> some of the challenges with the committees that are, the, the, there are a couple that come to mind uh, that they're all owners. So they all have a stake in the game, and that's where it gets challenging, right? Because they all have a vision for how they want their money to be, you know, Less earned, spent, you know, real spent. spent. Yeah. And, you know, if Jopchi says that, you know, he's not a team player, but it, I will tell you, though, in the, in the years that I've known him, he has actually gotten much better at, <laughs> at, at allowing other points of view to sway him. And I will take 100% credit for that because. Everybody always asks me, how did you talk Jopji into doing X, Y, and Z? <laughs> and it, it's, because, it's, it's because I understand where he's coming from, and never once have I said, okay, I, don't, I think that's stupid, and I don't like the fact that you didn't go with my idea. Because I just give up that idea, and I'll have another idea. So that's kind of how it works. I mean, we have two hotels now. You know, we didn't set out to do that. I just which is just, crazy, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's two great. hotels now. The, 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 we're, we're we're sitting right now in the Hyatt Regency SFO. We also have the Crown Plaza down the road. But yeah, I mean, he says that a lot about his. You know, but he's the, the the pinnacle of all the decision making, which is absolutely true. But in the years that I've known him, he has softened up quite a bit as far as as you know the the hard line. In, in the beginning, it was it was very much like yeah, I don't, I don't like the idea. We're not going to do. That. But I think he respects David and I enough to to really understand where we're coming from when we come to him with one well, of so, our crazy zany ideas. And, and and so so we understand that this is it's feeding up. And you mentioned events and registration. But just to like rattle them off, right? So you 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 have your sort of website registration, online presence, promotion piece. You have your staff, your volunteers, events. And when you mean events, you mean all the different things that are going on within the buildings. There's dealing with the hotel, setting up the hotel, um, managing all the finances, presumably is another big chore or task. Uh, and then what what other things? The exhibit hall. The exhibit hall and all the all the uh, yeah, exhibitors exhibit. and vendors that come in there. You know things like uh, what are those things called? The when people sell their games to each other. Uh, uh, flea market. Flea market. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of an event. And an auction. We have auction. auction. Yeah, we have, so you know the the, the impetus of Kubla uh, when when. When Anthony and Jabji first floated the idea of the name to the group of people from the two different conventions to kind of talk about it, they mentioned a very famous poem. And uh, yeah, we talked about Xanadu and a pleasure dome, okay, Kubla Khan. That, that's that is the source, it is the source of the name. Yeah. And that is the touchy feely stuff that made some people run to the hills. But when you really think about it, and it's no no pun lost on me that there's a dome on the top of this hotel. But we decided to create a pleasure dome of people to have fun. And that's kind of the, the idea is to encapsulate, you know, fun from all these different areas of gaming, social gaming, um, that, you know, allow people to have a very good experience. And, and, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to, because I think the audience might appreciate this. We're, we're not producing a game uh, convention. We're actually producing an experience, and it's it's experiential marketing. It's it, you know everything is about going to this place and letting people get out of their real lives to take a, a day or a few days to really escape and and have an experience that's that can't be defined by words. Right, right. Um, and that's that's Xanadu, and and, the, and it does take a team to do that. Mike Mike runs the, all the. Operations. He's now working on a lot of the media stuff, which is as we grow, we become more important. Um, there, there are a lot of team members involved. We have about uh, twenty-five actual staff, vested, what we call vested staff members, and uh, about seven, uh, seventy total, seventy staff. total staff members <coughs> that we manage that are all in charge of different areas. Um, and, and that's a huge number, right? Like that's. That's not just like a little project team. Like that's a company size of people um, that you're dealing with and having to manage. It, it is, and it, and it takes, it, you know, managing those people is also really important. This is another downfall, I think, of some conventions. And, and, and you know, we've been fairly successful thanks to people reining me in. Um, <laughs> but I mean that in a good way. 
Uh, but we've been fairly successful keeping the same team. And one of the things that, that I've done, and, and this comes back from my early business partner, which uh, which we mentioned in passing, Anthony Galeva was one of my part was my original business partner in Kublacon. And uh, again, as I mentioned, I like to not have partners, and so that we've gone our ways. We're still friends, but now I'm Kublacon. Uh, but one of the earliest things that we did is we, we created a program of vestedness. So our key staff members, if they stay with us for a certain amount of time, they actually share in the profits. And we give away, I give away 20% of the profits every year to uh, our vested staff members. And none of them, I'm absolutely sure, none of them work on the convention to make that check that they get at the end of the year. But when they get it, it's like, oh yeah, that guy treated me fairly. Those guys are good, you know. And treating your staff is is important. And I think I think that actually starts to probably some of the transitions going from sort of mom and pop's not the right way to say it, but small indie. I don't know what you call it, but like local friend conventions, uh, and then moving into sort of more of an institution convention, and 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 put that's something you have in place when you're doing it year over year for a long period. One of the things I wanted to mention, just to, to, for those who haven't been to KubaCon. Uh, Five years ago, I wouldn't have had much of a reference for a lot of conventions, but since then, I've gone to a ton of conventions. And um, KubaCon's re partly because of this hotel and the layout, too, but it's it's very different in that it's sort of a dome, but like a, a, a pillar-shaped circular space where you have the downstairs floor, which you have painting, and you have the kids' room doing this stuff, and a bunch of convention rooms, and the exhibit hall, and, and then you usually have your big games down there, and the open floor and registration, and then it sort of layers up into the second floor, which, you know, is not on camera. But it's like everyone's playing on tables, and it's not like a cafeteria, but it's just this open hotel space with a ton of tables. So it doesn't feel like, I think a lot of conventions feel like exhibit halls, and then like walking down along. It's like, I guess, the difference between a really nice hotel space for it versus like an exhibit, uh, ex, uh, exhibit center, whatever you call them, a uh, conference yeah. center. Um, and so you just have everyone easily playing together, and then it filters off into rooms and the side things. But it, it very much does have that, like you just walk up and you're like, oh, hey, everyone's just playing games and eating and moving around tables. It has much more organic, pleasant gaming with friends feel, even though it's a very large convention, um, than I think most do. I can't think of any other ones off the top of my head that sort of have that. Exactly. And that's by design. I, I'm actually, the, the, I might reference my kind of ooey-wooey, touchy-feely way of doing things, right, which I, I kind of am, but there is this thing, you know, it's Asian science of feng shui, right, and it has to do with how energies flow and, and, and in good ways or bad ways, and one of the things that, what I looked for when we were looking for this, for the Hyatt as a move from the uh, Hilton, was a, a, a good space that felt right, that felt really good, and, uh, and it's hard to even describe why this hotel, and we love it here, treat as well here, why that happens. And, and to me, the space is really important. Again, if you're thinking of doing something like this, don't just rent a room somewhere. You know, rent a room that has a garden attached to it, or something like that, just to, to make it feel good so people have a good feeling when they leave. Yeah, the, the atrium is something that you will hear people talk about when they mention KublaCon. They'll say, KublaCon is XYZ, and they have this really cool atrium where you can well, go play games. And I didn't even mention the, the openness of it, right? Yeah. The light that comes in. It's not, you're not outside, but it's bright. It feels like it. It feels yeah. like it's an outside space, which is, you know, it's part of that, uh, the synergy that, that we enjoy here. I mean, it's it's really hard to describe, and I think you, you mentioned, it's hard to describe the feeling. It's like a, when you're here, uh, especially from a staff person's point of view, walking amongst all the people, there's just this energy, this, this vibe that you can't describe it, but you certainly feel it, and it's, it's like nothing else. And especially walking through uh, even the flea market, I mean, just the energy and the, and the, the, the money changing hands, people buying people's secondhand goods, and it's just a kind of a really cool uh, event to, to, to witness. And it's, uh, it's also one of the reasons why a lot of people stay. Right. And, and it is as the staff, but also people coming back. Oh, yeah. camera's still going, but the lights went off. <laughs> All right, well, why don't we take a, a quick, quick break? Quick break. We're back with the lights Ooh. on. It's fantastic. Um, and it was actually a good transition point. One of the things that I wanted to ask you guys about was so, you know, you both started small conventions, right? They're chasing and saying, you know what? I live in this area and I'm going to make the next big giant. 5,000 person convention, Do it. you know, is, is a lofty goal, but probably not where you want to start. 
And so when you guys think about your history and everything you've learned, because right now there's a lot of conventions. More and more people are, are doing conventions, both from small you know, individuals, game stores are doing bigger things, you're seeing Kickstarter creators having a big game, like uh, I've seen with uh, Dice, uh, Dice uh, Throne had a game in there, like, we're going to do the Dice Throne convention. And then you're even seeing people like, you know, Patch trying to like come in and, and roll into that space. You know, when you think of, not the, all the different categories, but like if you were to break down, here are some key things to think about. If you wanted to, as an individual or a creator, whomever, have an event that was this, what are the, the starter things that come to mind if you do that? Well, I think first and foremost is the venue. Uh, it's going to be the most important because it's where most of your risk is going to be. Because unless you are like KublaCon, where you've been doing it long enough that you can get things like attrition out of contracts, then you're going to be on the hook for selling whatever they get you to agree to sell as far as the room nights. Uh, and that can actually uh, bankrupt a convention uh, when they just start. So it's, it's, it's baby steps. It's, it starts small. Um, don't worry about doing it on the cheap. You know, it doesn't have to look pretty. It's what you're delivering that's, that's the key. Um, and if you can start in a, in a, in a hall, uh, like a church or whatever, start small and then just grow from there. Because your, your biggest selling point is going to be the word of mouth right. and in, in your area. Um, and then just market it. Go to all your uh, FLGSs and, and you know, get flyers out, go attend th uh, things. Uh, one of the things, even for us, being as big as we are now uh, and, and getting more and more well known, I still do a lot of... Uh, engagement with the media. So I think I've done four podcasts already this year. Uh, we're here doing this. Um, I, I'm on Facebook a lot, plugging different events, sure. uh, working with key individuals, uh, cross-promoting with, uh, with Gen Con and other conventions. So it's, it's that kind of engagement that even whatever size you are, that gets the word out to just a few more people who then talk about it to a few sure, more sure. people, and that just kind of starts the whole ball rolling. Um, well, so, so just... Yeah. I just a couple follow-up questions. So when, when you're thinking about a space, right? So, you know, you can start with like, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to throw a bigger party at my house, right? right? Or whatever. And then you're like, no, that's not going to work because that caps at 20, right? And then you're like, <laughs> I'm going to go to the next. And so there is this space where if you're at a university or a church or some place where you can get um, a bigger room, maybe a game store is willing to let you take over their store for the, the and, and, you know, not exclusively, but let you use their tables or whatever, like a game castle. Um, you know, there's that option, and I just want this question I asked, you brought up on the hotel. So, so say I'm saying, hey, I actually want to do this at a hotel, just because I think that's, you know, I think people can sort of that's where people are jumping to right now. Right. You 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 ran through that contract stuff, and I don't want to be too particular about it, but what what should they keep in mind? So a hotel, just for somebody who has no idea what you're talking about, right? right? A hotel is going to say, all right, we'll let you use these rooms, these halls, this space, and you know, put flyers up that is at this hotel, and a typical condition is that is that is you're committing to a certain number of rooms. Like, what what is that give and take usually look like? Can you just pay them, or is it pay them and there's these other deal? Like, what you can. So, depending on what your financial situation is, if you have enough money saved to just buy outright the rooms you want to use, that's the best because you know you've got no no risk. Right. But when you don't have that, you really have to know that you're going to attract people. Uh, from the first, from the first time you start running, because if you can't, uh, things like food sales and room nights, if they're in your contract, they're going to hurt you. Because you're promising, you're promising, you're promising to get a certain, a certain number of room nights, and the threshold you have to meet. Correct. Right. And if you get different percentages, means you have to then pay less and less until you get to like 85, 90 percent sold out. Then you don't have to pay anything. But anything below that, you're going to be forking over money. And then same with food and beverage. They want to make sure they're making money. And you want to have food for your for your people, um, but even going back a step further, I mean, we can't. We we ran into this just this year trying to find a second hotel on this on this street, and that is trying to convince, not convince, trying to explain to a hotel what the hell a game convention is. Right, and not to be afraid of it. Right, right. They're used to like corporate events where everyone's got fat fat wallets, and you know they're. They're charging fifty dollars a plate for for the buffet, um, and they get no questions from these big companies that come do this stuff. Uh, but for us, we can't shoulder that because 
our attendees can't show for that. Right. So trying to convince, we worked with a couple of different ones here and we had to take, it took almost a month just to kind of get them on board for the least amount of risk. I, 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 Mike touches on some of the details of that. And in, in the bigger picture, I would say there are several models for somebody who might want to reach out to a hotel. And, and the short of it is, A, you buy out the rooms. They say, well, we're going to give you this ballroom and that ballroom. It's going to cost you whatever, $1,000. You know, uh, that's, a, that's an easy model. That's the dependable model where your risk is pretty low. The other one is say, well, I want this space, but I believe I'm going to have at least 40 people staying at the hotel every night and I can sell 40 of your rooms. And, they, and then they do something, they, they come up with a rate that's based on, you know, how many rooms you might sell. And now instead of paying a thousand dollars for those spaces, you're only paying $200. And for you as a as somebody running the event, you're not actually paying for the room. The guests are, you're getting a discount or something. So, you, you know, you're, you, it's this pass through service you're providing to the attendees, but then it's also giving you a discount on the space. Right, and this is where the risk comes into play right. because uh, go ahead. There's a thing called attrition. Yes. It's yeah. So attrition. attrition is literally a, a contract clause that states that if, if, if we give you this space, it is worth X to us. Now, if you compensate X with people staying in our hotel rooms, the X becomes smaller and smaller. But we're talking tens of thousands of dollars at the higher end, meaning but we didn't fill more than 50% of the rooms. You, they're going to get their money anyway. So it is kind of like you said, like a pass-through thing. It, at this point in KubaCon's uh, tenure, it, we are we are literally in the hotel, and we're not paying for any of the, the playing spaces because the hotel sells out, and the hotel is they're happy. They're happy to have people, thousands of people walking around here, you know, eating, playing, you know, whatever, because they're they're taken care of and they're fine. Um, but that's because you know, 18 years well, of doing you, you, this. You know, wh whether or not you you know uh, you, you break 4,000, you come in at 3,500. I mean, you you know you're going to get a ton of people. Correct. That's so that the risk becomes much much less when that happens. Now, getting a second hotel, that added aspect of risk. And like Jafji was saying, you know, being the decision maker, I had to make sure that when I presented him that package, that it had contingencies, that it had no attrition, which was not easy to convince a, a new hotel, um, but we're using this as a comparison. We're like, hey, we're over here. They make you know they make good money on that weekend. Don't you want to be part of the and the club? And, you know, and, and so the and, and the, the proof will be, we'll see in, in 2019. What what what? what well, we'll see where that takes. Yeah, us. I mean, yeah. and he makes a good point. We actually have two two different contracts. We have one here with the Hyatt, one at the Crown Plaza, and and we did structure the Crown Plaza different. And, just to clarify attrition, just so, so people could kind of wrap their hands around it. If you say I can, I can sell forty hotel rooms a night, or in our, you know, we do six hundred. But if you say forty, and you only sell twenty, they are actually going to charge you personally for those twenty rooms every night that you didn't sell. Right. Correct. Because that's they want their minimum forty. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other ways that that can be structured. So when we went to the Crown Plaza, Mike went to them. We, we, we really weren't sure of that model, and it's a good example of how, well, we would rather pay X dollars for the space and let you know that you'll probably sell this, this these amount of rooms. And at the same time, uh, tied into all of these, you know, room nights and space rental is also food and beverage. Uh, one of the reasons hotels are really hard to work with is the, uh, A, the corporate example. Uh, well, corporate corporations will come in and they'll they'll spend ten thousand dollars on a lunch for fifty of their uh, executives, and that's not going to happen at the game convention. Uh, likewise, a lot of weddings, depending where you're running this, and a wedding uh, will net you know bring in the hotel probably fifty thousand dollars in catering needs for you know between the wine and all the things that they do. So you're really up against what the hotel wants to do, not only in selling room nights but also. Uh, making their money on catering. So one of the things that we did with uh, Crown Plaza is, you know, give us this space for X amount of dollars discounted, and we promise to spend this much money on food. Right. And we feel like we can sell, you know, gamers like to eat, they'll have some food over there. Uh, we're also gonna cater some of our breakfast right. over there to offset that. But when you're looking at how the different ways of looking at a contract, there's there are different models in, 
it's just a matter of being creative. And, and, and uh, you know, again, I, I think it's good just to, I wanted to dig into one thing a little bit more specifically, just like, this is one of many things that turns into this big conversation with all right. these dependencies. Right. Um, so, figured out my, with the, the event, with the venue, um, you know, spreading the word, getting people to, to be aware of it. When you, when you think about, you know, when people are thinking about sort of the events and what's happening at the con, I, I feel like a number of people start out with like, well, I'll just, we'll have the space, I'll let everyone know the space is there, we'll have that person's game collection or some games on hand, and we'll get some other people to bring what they want, you know, their stuff, and then, you know, maybe go into it. Like, how much, when you're, when you're going from just sort of like everyone gets into a room and brings their stuff to um, step the next step, is it, is it the exhibit side that the next step? Is it the advance? Is it, should they focus in on, as a recommendation on just a core gamer type or, you know, like whether miniatures or CCGs or whatever? Or, I mean, do you have a sense of a recommendation there? Or? I have an idea. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to use HaitiCon mm -hmm. as an example. Haiti, H-A-I-T-I, -I, like the country. Uh, small, very small convention in San Francisco. It's run as a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. It's uh, in, a, in a church. Um, what I like what they did in, in terms of expanding out rather than, oh, we got this space, they took certain themes that they liked. You know, they, they liked having um, a protospiel. So they invited game designers to come and they took one room and said, okay, protospiel. It, it kept them from having to schedule every protospiel event or every game right. Right. event. Hey, like, bring your protospiel here. And exactly. They had a game library. They have several areas set for board gaming. They had one, games, one area set aside for... Um, uh, werewolf and you know so they, they they themed it a little bit they brought some focus to the different areas without having to create a complex schedule right and they bring food in too which is and they brought food in right here bring food. so that that's an example of how they you know they started small and, and because they're nonprofit they get some breaks on that too um, they don't have to pay for the church they don't have to pay at for least the not very much if they yeah. And uh, and that was that's an example of where the next step you could take rather I mean right. one step is say I got I got my personal big game library and in some ways this is what we do with GobbleCon. Uh, GobbleCon happens in November Thanksgiving weekend and I, I I didn't really want to run another convention but for various reasons uh, ended up doing uh, deciding to do GobbleCon at GobbleCon and uh, one of the things that I have not, which I haven't been to but uh, you, well you you will come because it's a it is way different than KubaCon. But it's also its own version of what's really fun. Uh, it is way scaled back. It is basically we have a bunch of tables and a whole lot of space in a great hotel. We do it here, and we have our game library, a thousand game or six hundred games. Come and play games. Uh, we do have some organized play with the uh, organized role playing groups. But overall, we just opened it up, yeah. and it is a different vibe. It's a different experience, and people like it. You know. But you're asking about what's the what's the next thing to bring in after you get those things. I, I would say definitely not an exhibit hall for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's going to be hard to convince them uh, that you're going to come if you can only tell them there will be 100 people there, right? However, what you could approach these uh, your local game stores with is to get sponsorships. And they can sponsor you as a whole, like, you know, blah 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 con brought to you by blah 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 you know, game store, or they can sponsor your badges get their name on every single badge, or they can sponsor an event. Like say, let's say they sell a lot of Warhammer 40K stuff. Well, you can say, hey, our 40K tournament is sponsored by, and, and prizes provided by. And that, that what that does is that ties in their vested interest in your success, because now people are gonna know about their store, and people from their store are gonna go to play, so you're starting to draw in that, that social circle, and, and expand the social circle. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't do the exhibit hall, but I definitely would do special events um, and just get the word out as far wide as you, as you want to, that, that, that you're capable of holding you know, in that whatever space you decided to get. But start small and be effective with, with, the, with the events that you're going to be hosting. And how much do you think people need to be worrying about like, uh, the safety and management of people, which is to say, like, so you're having this event, you have a lot of people whether it's harassment or just people breaking stuff or, you know, you're, you're like, there's just this line that goes from people you know and extended people you know and sort of that more intimate right. 
to then, once you start spreading the word out and then getting broader, and you maybe you hit 100, 200 people, is there, are there things that, are there safeguards you need to have in place? Do you just sort of say, well, well it's just people having fun? Like, how much do you have to worry about the health and livelihood of the people in, in the event? When does that, when does that, is there a size or a scale where that becomes like, no, you need to sit down and have, really understand how this works and what the liabilities are? Like, when does, when does it become liability? When do you start using the word liability in that, in that conversation? Oh. <laughs> so we <laughs> have a friend who produced a convention. Uh, and it just to get, there, there are different approaches to what you just described. Uh, one is to be absolutely to the law, legal letter, just to and really track everything down and really just, you know, do it. And the other is to just cover yourself, you know, make sure that, that people are A, having fun and that they're safe. And, and um, yeah, I, I think we kind of tend to the other uh, at Kublicon, but what, what I mean by that is we, we do have uh, very specific rules written in our on -site, online website, on our program book. We have harassment rules. We have, uh, you know, I'll cover a lot of bases with that. And uh, it, in the end, you, you know, you have, you have to trust humanity a little bit. Uh, but you also have to intervene as necessary, and sometimes it's not always pleasant. It's not always easy. Right. Uh, we do get insurance, and that's one of the things I do as the producer, executive producers. Uh, and I'll recommend this place. It's called InsureEvents.com. Uh, there's only one e between insure and events. Uh, there's probably other places online, but you go on, you fill out a form, and say I'm running one one or two day event, and it, it'll cover certain things. Um, but it's always nice to know that you have a little coverage in case something happens. Yeah. And, and, and this is a topic that is is really like stepping up uh, along with society. The, the, the need to have very specific harassment policies, very specific uh, corrective actions. Now, I will say for Kubla's size, uh, we've been very fortunate not to have uh, but a handful of either injury and or harassment type things. Uh, and we do tend to take care of it pretty quickly when things like that happen. Um, but I think the inclusivity uh, that that striving to to do, uh, Big Bad Con does a great job of that. Um, and, and you know, that's something that we all want to have at all of our conventions because the more inclusive you are, and the, the more exposure other people who may not think the same way get exposed to that, I think it, this becomes a safe place. Where everyone can drop those, those whatever those things are, those right. morals, those whatever that whatever it is that gives them the hang up, they can lower the shields, have a good time, play some games. and play some games, right? And if they can't, um, there is an escalation, okay, of, of how um, we take care of that. Um, but it starts with the individual, and that's why the things are written in the program. Uh, you you have to abide by those by by getting your wristband. You are saying that you understand and will follow these rules. And if you don't, then you won't be able to come back. Right, right. And it's, it's very strict. It's like, you know, usually it's one and done unless there's some other extenuating circumstances. Um, and we don't uh, tend to, to tolerate that kind of stuff. And so in terms of resources you mentioned, just to sort of wrap up around for somebody, you said insurevents.com. Mm -hmm. Are there other, I feel like, because I had this interview uh, with JT from The Game Crafter, and he was talking about some event planning software that he can't remember, I had to go back to the video, but are there other online, if I'm, hey, I'm, I'm interested in event, I mean, obviously, I, I would always recommend go to a local event and tell them it's not the same weekend and, and, and talk to them and get some advice from people in your area doing this sort of thing, but are there other online groups, forums, or communities that people who are interested in this could, could go to, to get more information or ask questions? No, that's a great, that's actually a really good, uh, really good question. I think we were actually talking about filling a small void there. Um, we're, we're thinking of launching a channel that we're going to uh, talk about, like the ins and outs of conventions, and put things out there. Talk about what's new with KublaCon and you know what's coming up with the next the next year, um, which could be a place to like give that information. But that's actually a, a void that I don't think has been filled yet, as far as a community or a web page or a Facebook page where. Convention runners actually go to exchange ideas. Like, do you guys have a convention runner event 
do you have a convention at our con? Is that like you a know, thing? <laughs> like, like, do you know each other? It like, could be. It know? could be. It could be. I mean, uh, we've we've invited like so for this year, um, we've invited two people from Gen Con to come here because they want to see how we do things. You know, and, and you might think, why would why would Gen Con care what a small con like this does? And you'd be surprised that they can glean even a small little change that they can implement and make things run that much smoother. And they, 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 they're sure that they're gonna find some little piece of a golden nugget somewhere. And so we've invited them to come down and they're gonna be kind of behind the scenes with us. To hopefully they'll get out there and play too, but they're gonna watch and they're gonna kind of like see how we do things here to see if there's anything that they can then take back and say, hey, you know, KubaCon does this when this happens or they run this this way. What do you think about doing that? And, and there, there is the Game Manufacturers Association Correct. of Gamma. And, uh, and they sometimes have tracks around producing conventions. At their origins. Or at the trade show. At the trade show. At the trade show. Or, or right. origins. Two weeks. One yeah. Years. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so there, there is a sort of a resource there, but you know their focus is on manufacturers. And um, I've actually gone there and talked about producing conventions there, but um, it's not really their focus. Sure. It'd be nice to see that they had a whole, you know, maybe some day that somebody would run a whole track and produce a convention. Well, it seems like, you know, again, just seeing more and more. I mean, just, it's hard. You're just stumbling across more and more conventions and more and more cities and more and more people taking, because I'm online, right? Seeing people at events and talking about this one and that one, right? With different, different things they're focusing on. So, I mean, it's an awesome scene, uh, for sure. Um, but I think the biggest problem with a con con would be who's in what? No, no. What weekend? Which, well, where, 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 <laughs> if you go to the calendar across like some sites that have like all the different yeah. conventions listed on them, which I think there is one site that does capture most, uh, you won't find a free weekend because there's only 52 weeks in a year. So there's more than 52 conventions. Yeah, some during obviously. Week. Yeah. So I mean, if someone was serious about doing that, I mean, that, I'm actually the gears are now turning, but uh, that actually is a really good idea, I think, because that would. Um, that would have tracks of people like Jeff G and myself, you know, having panels, you know, teaching people or showing people, you know, what we do and whether that would be applicable to them or not. Um, but yeah, again, trying trying to find a weekend that is not going to exclude somebody where they feel they can't go because they're running their show that weekend. Um, that, that's actually an interesting idea. But yeah, I don't, I don't know anything about weekends in the year. Um, well, awesome guys. I mean, again, we sort of were all over the place over the course of the discussion, but. I was just really excited about the opportunity to just get a feel from this part of the industry, right? And yeah. and, and for sure, as a local guy, thanks for, for doing it. Uh, I, I, setting can up all the can I take just a minute to give you my final wrap-up? Are we winding yeah, up? Yeah, we are winding up. Excellent. We're winding up. We're winding, yes, winding and I, uh, I just want to give my final wrap-up sure, tips, because like you said, we're all over, and there's a lot of really interesting things to talk about, but if I had to sum up what it is to take to run a convention, uh, a good space, uh, some financial viability and understanding the risk. And uh, the one thing we didn't really talk that much about was the importance of your staff and the people who are helping you um, to treat them well, to you know, just treat those people well. Because if, if you start playing games with them or changing the rules midstream or whatever it is you do that upsets a game master or upsets the person who's running your rich, that, that, that's going to look bad on you. And in the end, you want to keep those people really happy. And so, me, it's space, staff, and you know, paying attention to the details. Mike, yeah, that's that. Those are all sound, sound uh, points. I think uh, the only other thing that I would say uh, to make it successful is to make sure that you have the passion and the fire in you to to do something like this because it is something that will take your soul if you aren't careful because it. It can be crushing and devastating if you put all this energy into something and it just bombs. It would just be terrible. So you want to make sure that you're ready for that, you, you understand the risks, and then you have a good team. You can fit family, your best friends, okay? Despite the friends don't let friends when you're on game conventions, it's okay to have them help you, you know. Stay <laughs> Once they've accepted it, you're accepted. <laughs> that's right. Um, well, yeah, and that's sort of like a Kickstarter where, you know, just because you're really passionate about making a game and having your game design doesn't necessarily mean you're the right person to go do and, and try to take on becoming a publisher, right? And so oh, yeah. that, that you know, it, it may perhaps be you deter deciding, oh, I really would love a con in this area, we really should do one, but then perhaps not finding a friend, finding somebody else or other people 
or more with that skill set to help them set it up. Identifying the need doesn't always mean you need to then run off and try to right. fix that need if you're not the, the skill set to do it. But Correct. You can also just try it and have fun and figure it out along the way. That's true. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, one, I guess we're sort of winding up, but uh, one of the things about myself is that I've worked in stage production, video production pretty much all my life. And, and a lot of those skills of organizational skills you know, been brought into the equation. So if you find that you're not only a gamer who wants to do this, but you have that sort of background, then you're, you're poised well, you know, even if it's, you know, organizing church events or whatever it is sure. that you've done. You know. Community organizer. Thank you. Yeah. You, can go, you can go anywhere as a community yeah. organizer. So, um, thanks for being on, and thanks everyone for watching. I think this has been an extended video, but um, cool. where, where, can we, where can people learn about KubaCon? It's time it, to get their plans. Oh, it's, it's, they're oh, yes. getting on late, but yeah. how one? www.kublacon.com. There you can get to the events, which is at .info. Uh, you can get to the registration uh, there as well through Eventbrite. And the hotel uh, uh, reservations are also on the website. Awesome. Excellent. And, and I, will, I will be at Kublacon as well, so we can hang out if you come. So thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Absolutely. Too. Hey everybody, Edo here, and thanks for watching Gaming with Edo. Reviews over here on this playlist, League and Insider videos over here on this one. Subscribe, share, all that good stuff. But most importantly, play some great games. Thanks. Bye.